Hey, everybody. Welcome to Back in Time, the Buffalo Sports Museum, where we talk to people of Buffalo's great and sometimes not so great Buffalo sports past. And uh, I can't believe how many people have texted me, have emailed me and said how great these episodes have been. We've had some really interesting guests on. And, you know, we have, again, two phenomenal guests on tonight to talk a little bit more Sabres hockey. And uh, I'm going to welcome them both. And if you can see them already, you probably know who they already are. One is Mr. Paul Whelan. Paul Whelan, former uh, publicity director for the Sabres, former director of communications for the Buffalo Sabres and broadcasting. And the other is Mr. Seymour Knox Four, who is one of Buffalo's most well-known people. Uh, we Everybody knows Seymour and uh, uh, son of Seymour Third and Gene Knox. So we're going to welcome them both. And how you doing, guys? Great, John. Thank you for having me tonight. John, it's, been, yeah, John, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I can't think of anything else to say about you that would be nice. So let's go on from there. <laughs> I love it. That that shows how great a show it's going to be. We already have the uh, we have the we're, we're flying with the remarks, so that'll be great. Um, again, <laughs> thanks both of you for coming on tonight and being part of this. Um, Seymour, you and I talked for uh, over the last couple of years about doing something like this to be able to record uh, people that you know, maybe, maybe the, uh, the public hasn't heard from in a long time and, and their stories need to be heard. So I, I give all the credit to you for putting that bug in my ear. Uh, what do you think about this? Well, I can't thank you enough, John. It's, it's great and it's nice to see Paul uh, on this Zoom, which is fun. And it's nice to see your wife in the background. She looks great. Hi, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, for those of you that don't know, you've got three goalies on <laughs> the Zoom tonight. <laughs> I, I was going to mention That's right. that. I'm, That's right. We have three goaltenders. And, you know, it, it explains a lot with this crew that, you know, we all played in that era where we had hardly any of equipment. Paul, you probably played in the era you didn't even wear a mask. But um... <laughs> actually, I started without a mask for a couple of years playing senior hockey. Yeah, I wasn't too smart. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, we all picked our position, so we have nobody to blame but ourselves. But uh, now, Paul, it, you, probably, you had the opportunity to uh, skate with a couple of guys back in the day, I believe, didn't you? During the 70s, when Imlac was the general manager, I spent about six years, uh, six, seven years uh, playing a lot in practice, Seymour, and I played with, uh, with the varsity, and uh, I found out how terrible a goaltender I was then. I, 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 you know, playing against, although the highest level of players in the world, as you well know, is quite an experience. I think you did it a couple of times yourself with the Sabres. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's like, until you get up to the speed of the, of the NHL, even at that time, uh, it's really uh, sort of hard to imagine how fast these guys are and how fast they made their decisions on the ice. It was like, whoa, look out. I'm thinking about a play in the other wing, and they're already all across coming the other way. <laughs> and then it's behind you. <laughs> I was, I was going to mention. Oh, yeah. Well, that, I didn't get my nickname, my nickname, Paul the Stiv, for nothing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we played the, the uh, Sabres alumni about nine years ago. And I'll tell you, and those guys still, I mean, Danny Gare pumped two by me like I didn't even move. I mean, he just parked himself in the slot and he's 60 something years old and he still shoots the puck like, like he was 21 and I didn't even see him. So that's how, that's how good they really are. It's amazing. So Paul, uh, look, tell us a little bit, a little bit of something of yourself from your past. I know you went to uh Timon, grew up in South Buffalo, went to Timon. And um, I believe you started with the Sabres right in the beginning in 1970. So tell us about that. August of 1970, I went to training camp in Peterborough uh, and uh, signed up. Well, actually, I signed up ahead of time, but I went directly to training camp. I left a PR job with General Motors in New York City in the GM building and uh, 
I bring that up because uh, that was the only nice thing about it. I had a beautiful office. I really was bored by corporate public relations and had a chance to uh, come and meet uh, Seymour and Norty and Dave Foreman and uh, they offered me the job and I uh, took it. My wife was not particularly happy, although we're from Buffalo because that was our third move in two years. I went from Detroit, the promotion to New York, and then back to Buffalo. And I had just gone to Detroit, you know, so I was in a period of three years, two and a half years, we moved three times, sold three houses. How about that one? Ugh. Yeah, I, I can understand why Betty was a little questioning what your, uh, what your future was going to hold. But you made the right move coming to the Buffalo Sabres. <laughs> yes. Oh, See, I sure did. It was great. It was wonderful. Best years of my life. Seymour, what about you? I, you were very young uh, when your parents, when your father and your uncle started to pursue a National Hockey League team. What do you, how old were you when that started? And what do you remember about that? Well, uh, <clears throat> quite a bit. <laughs> Uh, Dad and Norty tried to get the team in the 1965-66 uh, expansion at that time, and they were on the board for a team called the Buffalo Bisons. Uh, you have a Buffalo, two Buffalo Bison jerseys right behind you. Mm -hmm. And so we were uh, sort of spoon-fed the Bisons growing up, and we had the opportunity to have, oops, uh, at our house, believe it or not, uh, Emil, the cat Francis, and I remember uh, a gentleman named Rudy Pillis uh, coming to the house when we were younger. Uh, we didn't have the team at that time with the uh, first expansion, but we came in in the 69-70 uh, expansion, and I remember getting a telegram uh, when I was going to school at Brooks up in North Andover, Massachusetts, that we got the team. And it was right around my birthday. It was uh, December 2nd, actually. Uh, my cousin Linda, uh, Norty's daughter's birthday. So it was a great birthday present for many, many years. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. Uh, Paul, we'll go back to you. Now, you know, you're a member of the Sabres organization in August of 1970. Um, your duties were not quite up to PR director. I think Chuck Burr was the was the PR director at that point. So were you under Chuck? Well, they had hired Chuck Burr. And I, yeah, they had hired Chuck Burr and, and uh, they were not happy with his uh, uh, performance for one reason or another, not by my call. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't even know they had him. They had, they had talked to me a year before about possibly coming and I, uh, or right after the, you know, right after they got the franchise and uh, I got a call from Buffalo and I said at that time, I really couldn't come I mean, I couldn't even consider it. Just bought a house in New Jersey and a new job in Manhattan. But um, uh, I uh, so I, the deal was I was hired technically as the assistant public relations director. Uh, the, Seymour and Norty were always very uh, conscious of the way people uh, exited or entered the company. It was a family kind of business. And they certainly didn't want Chuck Burr's reputation to be Sallied uh, in any way, sullied, I'm sorry, in any way by the fact that he, I, they asked him to leave, which is a nice way to get fired. I, but, it, you know, I, it was the way it went. And, I, you know, I didn't even know about that until after I took the job that they had someone already, so uh, that they were going to uh, exit out the door. That's, you know, God bless Chuck. He's been dead a few years now. He was a, a very good PR guy. He was, I think, part of it, guys. It's a story out of the past, but part of it was, for one reason or another, he and Punch Imlac did not get along. And Punch was the general manager, and the PR guy didn't work for the general manager. But if you were the PR guy and you didn't get along with the general manager, you you know you, you, that was the kiss of death. And I think with Chuck, from what I understand and knowing Chuck's personality, I could see he and Imlac having uh, contra temp uh, all the time. You know, it was a. Uh, uh, yeah, they were two hard-headed guys, and only yeah. one of them was going to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you you fit right in with Seymour and Punch. I mean, they 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 probably loved you and your sense of humor and your work work ethic early in the uh, in that first uh, couple seasons. Well, I you know I I was a hard worker. Yeah, I've always been a hard worker. Uh, I think, and uh, 
uh, my sense of humor is, I mean, it's, you can't stop it. I'm sorry. I'm going to go to my grave, probably cracking a joke. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, it's, punch, punch was, because I was uh, familiar with hockey, even though not at a professional level, but I played, you know, since I was a kid and I had uh, followed the Bisons and I used to help Charlie Barton at the Courier, the late Charlie yeah. Barton with doing stats at games in the, in the odd and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I, I was, you know, I was a natural in that sense. Uh, uh, and I was a Buffalo guy. I was uh, my hometown and I knew the town and, you know, knew the community fairly well for a young person. Yeah. It, it, Seymour, what do you remember about Paul those first couple of years? I mean, you were young. <laughs> you had to know who he was. <laughs> Well, I, I didn't get to know him for a long time until I'm going to say maybe 1987, I came up to Buffalo. Wow. wow. I had the opportunity to work for three yeah. years in Rochester, and I, I was working in a, a, a different career at that time. Uh, and uncle, my Uncle Norty got sick. Uh, he had uh, colon cancer at the time, and Dad called up and said, hey, we need you. Can you move to Buffalo and work with the hockey, the hockey team? And I was like, are you kidding? Really? You want me? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great phone call. So it's it was one. a great phone call. And uh, at the time we were setting up New England Sports Network. So uh, in, my re in my real job. So it was uh, very challenging and at the same time, very exciting. And a couple of years later, after I paid my dues down in Rochester, I had the opportunity to come and work with the Sabres in a variety of different capacities. And one of my favorite capacities was working in a TV truck with Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that had to be fun. Believe it or not. So I, I was on the Chiron uh, for a season, which was lots of fun with uh, Danny Neverth Jr., uh, Paul Whelan, Paul DeWald, uh, Betsy Mongovian. Um, I think we had two other people in the truck, but I'm drawing a blank. Just off the off the top of my head, Paul. Do you remember who Pat else? Pat Trinkley was, was one. Oh, Trinkley. Yeah, Pat Trinkley. Yeah. Yeah, Pat Trinkley was. Yeah, and then uh, uh, let's see who else was in the truck. Betsy, uh, you. Oh gosh, sitting up front. I can't. I don't recall either. Uh, different <laughs> different trucks have different sizes for the number of people up front. So I'm just Absolutely. doing that on the top of my head. Uh, yeah, a we had a lot of fun ago. though in that truck. We had a lot of fun oh, yeah. in that truck. I can imagine. I have a, I have a lifetime nickname from Paul, which is his stuck. <laughs> what is it? Which is what? Wait, Paul, you know what it is. The, the quad. Which is what? The quad. Oh, the quad. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not, I was pretty loose with nicknames, John. And uh, yeah. it's easy to see more. The fourth, I just call him, made it easy. I call him the quad. So. Quad. Board. I'm probably the only person in the world that still calls them that, but I did. You notice I didn't do it tonight, Seymour. But now I'll do it. I was, hey, I was waiting. I was, I was waiting. <laughs> That's great. And it was a, uh, you know, it was a great ex experience uh, to be able to be in a truck, see what was happening, learn the game. Actually, from I think at that time we had eight different cameras. Paul, if I'm if I'm correct, we had. Two goals. Uh, uh, I think seven, maybe. I made it look seven. like eight. I fooled around a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we had we had all the tape machines in the back, which was uh, you know a lot of fun to uh, see all the replays and get everything queued up so that everything comes off flawlessly when you're watching the game. But there's there's a lot yeah. going on behind the scenes. Well, I can imagine. Oh uh, yes, Paul. I, I want to. Uh, go to you for for a couple of segments here and not that we don't love Seymour but I, I want to get a couple of things in with Paul now I'm going to jump ahead to 1973 and it's a it's a pretty famous story most people in hockey have heard this story before but it um it directly concerns you um sometime during that 1972-73 season you know if you you being a goaltender would know more than anybody you you, you looked at Ken Dryden's pads and you had an inkling that there was something just not right about his pads. Maybe they were a little bit too wide. So, and I'm, and I'm going to yeah. kind of give you the story. God, first, I yeah, I guess they were. Yeah. <laughs> you go to punch and you say, these guys' pads are too wide. And from what I heard, punch kind of held onto it for a good time 
to be able to bring that up. And can you talk a little bit about what happened with, with his pads? Yeah, I was baby Dryden. Ken's brother was playing golf for Buffalo and he was a buddy of mine because I got to know him a little bit being practice goalie occasionally. And uh, uh, well, I was watching the, the morning skate warm up for the Canadians there in town to play the Sabres. And I looked at Kenny's pads and I thought, my God, I thought he was carrying around a, two Goodyear blimps on his legs. They were so wide. So I, um, I went to Dave and I said, this is, Savers were going to skate, that skated earlier. I say, hey, Dave, your brother's pads are too wide. And I said, you know, he's beaten it. It's only 10 inches wide they could be. His are at least 12 right. inches wide. So Dave said, well, yeah. I said, that's a penalty. And he said, you think I'm going to tell him? And I thought, oh, good idea. You know, no, don't tell him. So then just to make sure I went, I snuck into the Canadian dressing room through the help of someone who got a, had a key but I'm not going to identify that person um, who worked for the Sabres. And I put the pads on my legs and I took a tape measure in there. And with the pads on my legs, they were 12 point, or 12 and a quarter inches wide, both of them. And that was the two inches over the, the limit. And it was a two minute penalty for using illegal equipment. So oh, I go to Imlac and I think I'm so, I'm pretty proud of that, you know, like, and I said, Vaughn, she's got, you know, she call it, get a penalty call tonight. He said, no, no. I want to wait. I have a feeling we're going to play them in the playoffs. I want to wait for the right moment. So I, I didn't forget about it, but I didn't think a hell of a lot about it either. And we get in the playoffs and it was in the, uh, I think the uh, second game of the uh, playoffs in Montreal, Buffalo was, lost the first game. It was five. It was third, game five. Game? Game, yeah, five. game five. Okay. See, my in, memory in forum. remiss. So it was in Montreal. In Black, uh, mm -hmm. Bruce, yeah, Bruce Hood, that's right. Bruce Hood was a referee. Timmy Horton was the captain. Joe Crozier was the coach. And at just one moment in the game, late in the game, all of a sudden, Horton goes over to Bruce Hood and starts gabbing at him. And Hood's just, just gesticulating back to him. And finally, Hood, he pulls out a, a, a measure from his pocket. And he told me later, it was the first time he ever used that measure in all the years he was a referee. And uh, it was a measure of the, you know, the equipment. He goes over and he measures, made Ken Dryden come to the bench. He measures his pads, blew his whistle, called a two-minute penalty. And it's right late in the game, and it's tied, right, in the third period. So Lorenzo, Jimmy Lorenzo's centerman, one of the centers, and he goes in right after the penalty. You know, the Canadians are shorthanded, and he hits the crossbar behind oh. Dryden. So I thought, well, anyway, at the end of the period, the best part of the story to me is what happened with Bowman afterwards. Scotty was coaching the Canadians. He went absolutely apeshit on the bench. Absolutely crazy, like only Scotty could. He went up in the stands at the end of the period, grabbed the hold of Clarence Campbell, the president of the league. Mr. Campbell was a distinguished guy. He was a prosecutor at Nuremberg, right? You don't just grab him and yank him out of his chair. Scotty did. And he dragged him all the way to the Sabres dressing room. And he pounds on the door and it's Mr. Campbell, sir. He wants to talk to you, Mr. Imlac. And Imlac's in there. He's got the door locked. He won't let anybody in, right? And of course, what we had done in, in the dressing room, uh, Frank Christie and Rip Simonic had taken all the Sabres equipment, goalie equipment, measured every single thing, yeah. gloves, how every single part of equipment a goalie wore that was visible and made sure it was within the, within the rules. But he still wouldn't let us look at the Buffalo equipment. And Bowman later, later told me the story about how he went berserk. I didn't know he went berserk. And I was doing the game with Jana Red on the radio. I was the color man. And when it happened, I, I turned to Rick and I, he says, well, I don't know what this is. He, you know, like Rick is very seldom caught short, but he didn't know what the hell was going on. And I turned to him and I said, oh, they're just measuring his goalie pads. They're too wide. And he looks at me, you know, I could see, you could, you could just picture Jana Red turning, you know, giving you that look, right? You know, like, yeah. you dumbo. And I said, honest, Rick, that's the truth. That's, <laughs> I know. And, and it, I'm on the air, so I can't explain on the air, right? Right. That I stuck it in their dressing room or anything. So I, so now the guys from Hockey Night are running down the, the old the press box in the, in the forum trying to find out what's going wrong. And they're, you know, Hockey Night's like, they're the, the, the Bible, right? Yeah. And they got to have it right. And they couldn't find out. And finally, one of the guys, one of the producers comes down, or one of the guys, he says, you know anything about this? I said, yeah, his goal pads are too wide. And 
what? That's a penalty. And he's, what? What? You know, he's, he didn't believe me. He thought I was crazy. So um, in the overtime, Rene Robert scored early in the overtime to win the game. And uh, I, I, <laughs> sort of, I sort of felt, yeah, like Seymour Shake putting his hands over. Set. I sort of felt like I really directly contributed to a Sabres win in the playoffs. I mean, you know, not yeah. through my hockey playing ability, but through my knowledge of the rules. And that helped right. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. How fun. great, great would it have been? How great would it have been if Lorenz would have scored on that power play? I mean, that would have been even more unbelievable to have that directly result in a goal. But you yeah, know, blame Lorenz though. Yeah, Batman. He he, <laughs> he he hit a lot of posts in his day. Great story though. Thanks for sharing that with us. See, what, do you remember that? Do you ever? You're I do. do you remember that? actually, Paul? Do you remember flying back into Buffalo that night on the Convair? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was we, kind of popular that night. <laughs> we, were, we were very popular that night. And believe it or not, John, yeah. there must have been two, three, maybe even four or 5,000 people just like meeting the Bills. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. Now, we were there. We all came off the tail of the uh, Convair airplane. And it was sort of fandomonium, so to speak. Yeah. It was, it, it was it, a great night. It, it was craziness back then and I was only 10 years old a little fan and and I was truly absorbed by what the Sabres were doing that earlier in their existence uh, if they're only being in the league for three years I got wrapped right up into it it just made me even more of a hockey fan it's it's too bad they had to lose uh two nights later in the thank you Sabres game to wrap the season up but it's still that season is remembered as one of the best and funnest in Sabres history and you guys were both right there right there with yeah. it so it great was, story it was very special that whole that whole series yeah yeah paul you uh, want to talk about you know, what happened guys, when uh, the... go ahead see i was gonna say paul you want to talk about what it was like for the sabers to get into their first playoff uh series and what happened well yeah inside, I, inside I, I will the i get to the, thank you the ticket yeah. area and all it was things. it was uh it was like like a circus in there. People were uh, just entranced by the team and how well they played and how well they were playing that series. And when they lost, I think it was four to two in game six, I think, if I remember yep. correctly, Canadians took them out of the series in the last couple of minutes. I think to this day, I have never, ever felt a chill. In fact, thinking about it right now, I'm getting a chill. It was the most... Um, probably the most, certainly over the 25 years I was with the Sabres, the most uh, amazing moment in my personal life. I started to get a chill when the fans stood up and continued to chant, thank you, Sabres, for minutes at a time. That was what made it great. It wasn't just for a minute. It was like it went on and on and yeah. on until the end of the game. And it was spontaneous. Just, you know, yeah, some, they, somebody it was must like, and I could, yeah, spontaneous. Nobody led them. Somebody, Somebody must have started, started it, it, and there we went. And there it went, and, and yeah. now it's it's famous in Sabres history, the, Saint, the thank you Sabres uh, chant. I want, I want to uh, scoot ahead, because I, like I said, I want to keep this moving. I, I, there's so much, I mean, we could do five hours with you guys, um, but I want to keep uh, scooting ahead because I know time is at a, at a premium. Uh, we, we jump ahead a year to 73, 74, and, and the, the year was just, it was not a good year in Sabres history. Gilbert breaks his leg, and then February comes, and Tim Horton is killed in a, in a, a one-car accident coming back from the game in Toronto. And, Paul, I want you to talk a little bit about how you found out, and, and from that point on, how the rest of the world found out. Well, when Imlac got Horton to play for the Sabres, one of the parts of Timmy's deal, if you will, his contract – was that he would get a, a brand new sports car. So he picked out a Tommaso Pantera, which was a Italian body uh, sport powered, V8 powered uh, sports car, custom coach work from Italy. And you could find them across the States, rich guys bought them. Well, that's what Timmy got. And, and that's when he drove back from Buffalo. And that's what he killed himself in. The car that he got is a signing bonus, or what well, I don't know what a signing bonus, but you know, it was part of his deal. And uh, 
Imlac just almost never forgave himself for that. He would talk about it, you know, even years later, that if I only wouldn't let him buy that car. And, you know, he might have killed himself in any car that night, as, you know, as we all know, people have automobile accidents. But um, I get a call about four in the morning from the provincial police. The old media guy, they had a copy of it, and I guess we had sent him one, and it said public relations. So it could have my home number in it, right? So they called me and some cop on the line at whatever time it was in the morning telling me, and I was like, got to sleep, but I was you know, like, what? We had, I had come back to the bus with the team the night before from Toronto, and uh, he told me that Horton was killed, and he started to explain it to me and where it happened, and ironically, it was right on the, uh, on the uh, center line, center uh, divider, right in front of the old uh, hotel that we used to stay in in training camp in St. Catharines. I can't even remember what brand name it was, the hotel, but whatever. Um, yeah, and so I I called uh, uh, Punch, and uh, he called Joe Crozier, and, uh, and then the world, you know, the world knew out of the police report. It was, um, you know, I, I never, well, you know, the only time I ever saw Jimmy Schoenfeld cry, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with crying, by the way, for in a moment of grief, but was, you know, here's this big, tough kid who, who thought the world of Horton, he was his, his mentor, he was his teacher, he was, you know, the guy he played defense with a lot of the time, uh, and Shawnee was inconsolable that next day. He was, he was crying, you know, bowing in for, and then there was a game that night. If you remember, they all wore black armbands. I think they yeah. played Atlanta. If, do you remember? Yeah, we played Atlanta. Atlanta. I think it was Atlanta yeah. the next time. They're yeah, down yeah. four to one and, and stormed uh, back to tie the game four in, four. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. what do you remember about yeah, I that? Ties. I would think well, yeah. just, like, just like Paul, I had the opportunity to be in Toronto that night with my dad. <laughs> yeah. And we were back in the locker room area. We were talking with uh, Tim. He was the third star of the game that night. He'd also had a uh, broken jaw. I believe Rennie Robert had broken it earlier in the week in uh, practice. Paul, you may uh, remember that. And uh, Dad and I got in the car and we drove back down to Buffalo and I got up to go to school the next morning and we had uh, breakfast at home. We had a, uh, my mom was cooking and we had sort of runny scrambled eggs and uh, I was sitting next to Dad at breakfast and he wasn't even touching his uh, breakfast at all. He, was, he had a uh, very voracious uh, appetite and I got to school around eight o'clock and uh, the story had broken on the radio but we had never yeah. heard about what had happened to Tim um, that night I mean my dad knew but he didn't say anything to uh, anybody at home so it was yeah it was a real shock uh, yes. I remember being at the arena the next night all the players had uh, black armbands everybody was crying for the national anthem and we had the opportunity later to, uh, you know, help out the Hortons, uh, Lori Horton and uh, her kids. Yeah. I found out our lunch lady at school told us, and we were like, I was in fourth grade. I was like, what? But no, he played last night. What are you talking about? Couldn't believe it. But you remember it was the pre-internet, pre-cell phone era. And I mean, you didn't really hear about these things until maybe hours or even a day later. Just such a sad time in, in, um, in Buffalo history. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, Paul, I want to skip over uh, the Taro Tujimoto drafting because that's, that's going to be a big segment. And I just want to get a, a small segment in before our break. Um, in 1977, you almost played in an NHL game. Uh, in uh, in February of 1977 against the Minnesota North Stars, what was the uh, well? Was the big story I, I about that? I don't think I would have played unless I, I don't think I would have played. I almost dressed for the game. Uh, what happened was uh, uh, Jerry Desjardins had been hurt, and uh, we had Donnie Edwards and Bob Sobe both in on rookie contracts down in the minors. One at Hershey and one at I don't remember the other team. Providence, I think, Bobby Sobe was playing. Yeah. And uh, the morning of the, uh, 
the game, the only goalie we had who was alive and kicking was Al Smith, <laughs> suitcase Al Smith. And uh, um, Edwards was called up from the minors, but Imlac told me all my equipment was laid out in the dressing room. And he said, if Edwards doesn't get here, you're backing up Smitty tonight. <laughs> and I thought, you're kidding me. He said, no, I'm, I'll Frankie call you later if he gets in. You know, he gets in. If he doesn't get in, you get down here. You're, you're dressing for the game as a backup. And I said, you're, you know, like, I, he says, I'm not kidding. I, this is this serious deal, right? Yeah. So uh, afternoon went on, 4 o'clock. I get a call in my office. It's Frankie Christie, the trainer. Uh, and he says, uh, well, Edwards is in, so you don't have to worry about it. You're all set. Okay. Good. Uh, the only guy that took shots that morning, by the way, was me. They were afraid to put a throw in there. If he got hurt, yeah. they were screwed, right? So. Edwards got in, and I was up to win the game in the press box on radio with Rick Jenneret. I was the color man. And all of a sudden, one of my assistants came to me and started shaking me by the shoulder right at the opening face-off time. And, and I, I'm, on, I'm on the air, right? And I turned around, I'm waving her off. And she says, no, no, Mr. Imlac wants, wants you to talk to him right now. Not, 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 not the next, but right now. Like, and I'm going, okay. So I put down the headset. I walked off. He said, get down here and get your stuff on. Because what had happened before the game, Al Smith, who, when he found out he wasn't going to start in goal, Edwards was going to start, he went over in front of Seymour and Doherty, if I remember correctly. You might have been there, uh, Seymour. Gave uh, the way, gave the the way yeah, right. And he waved goodbye. And he skated <laughs> off the ice. He took his equipment off and has never been seen in Buffalo since. <laughs> he just left. And so that left Donnie Edwards alone. And uh, so I went down, I got almost all my equipment on, you know, they, they go out and I was going to go out at this, you know, break in the action and go skate to the box and be embarrassed because <laughs> who's, who's that old guy skating out there? <laughs> anyway, um, and then Frank Adveri, who was the supervisor of officials, and you all remember Frank from climbing the glass as a linesman or a referee, great guy. And he came down, he said, he came into the dressing room, he said, Paul, he said, you might as well take that stuff off. I said, why, Frank? He said, because you can't go in anyway. Why not? He said, because in those days, you had to have your starting lineup in 20 minutes before the game. That was because of Scotty Bowman changing goalies all the time at St. Louis at the last second. Yeah. You know, that was yeah. a Bowman rule. So what it did was affected my chance for glory. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I, so then I had to go back upstairs. And I never mentioned it to anybody except to my wife for, for yeah. a long time. I yeah. didn't want to tell Janet, I mean, I don't want to tell Ted Darling. I don't, you know, I just thought, I mean, if it happened, they would see, you know. And if it didn't happen, what was I supposed to say? Guess right. what? I got wiped out. But I'll tell you guys, I'm an old guy and I wasn't that young then. I went down those 112 steps from the press box down to the bottom. Oh, yeah. 112 steps. And I went, I missed every other one going down to get my stuff on, <laughs> but it didn't do any good. I saw a quote later on, years later, Al Smith said, he goes, when the game just doesn't make sense to you anymore, you get out. And he just left. And, you know, funny thing is, he, he played professional hockey. He played in the WHA um, later yeah. on. And, 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 and back in the NHL, I think he actually played in the NHL again, too. So you never know. Um, see, what do you remember about that? Quick, we got about a minute and a half. I remember having the national anthems. I remember – Skate right over, waving to mom and dad, mom and dad and Norty, and then he took off. <laughs> and it, it was like this. See you later. I I can imagine. I can't even imagine like Floyd Smith going like, where the hell's he going? What's, what's going on with this guy? And Donnie Edwards too had to be go because he had to skate right past Donnie to get through the the, the, the door. Donnie had to be going. What the heck is going on? With where's this guy going? You know and. I can't even yeah, imagine so the, the emergency goalie. The emergency goalie that night after uh, you know after I couldn't go down and get dressed was Jimmy Schoenfeld. By the way, he volunteered yeah, believe, to, if he had to. He'd go in and put on the pads and go and goal. That's yeah. old. That's old school. That's how you did it, guys. We're gonna wrap up this part right. because we're almost out of time. Uh, we'll come back and we'll see you again in a few minutes and uh, part two. So thanks again for coming and we'll see you in about five minutes. Sounds great. Bye-bye. All right. Okay.